On April 8, 2024, the United States experienced a total solar eclipse. If you live in New York City like me, then your experience may have looked something like this. In this video, I want to break down what a solar eclipse is, and because this is a Jewish channel, I want to talk about its relevance in Jewish culture, as well as the role the solar system plays in Jewish tradition at large. To understand the solar eclipse through the lens of Jewish tradition and culture, we need to start at the beginning, literally, on day number four of creation. The Torah tells us, Vayomer Elohim, Yehima Oros Berakia Hashemayim, and God said, let there be lights in the sky. Lahavdil ben hayom ben halayla, to separate between day and night. And then it tells us the four roles of these lights. Laisais, for signs. Ulamoadim, festivals. Layamim, for days. Vishanim, for years. So in order to understand these four roles and the way that the solar eclipse fits into this perspective, Let's start with the second role, which is festivals. Now, these are referring to the Jewish holidays that occur throughout the year. But to really understand this, let me ask you a question. What is the first mitzvah that the Bnei Yisrael received? The first commandment that was given to the Israelites? If you said Rosh Chodesh, then you would be correct. Now, if you don't know what Rosh Chodesh is, it's the celebration of the first day of the month, specifically the first day of the lunar cycle, which we call the new moon. Now, the moon goes around the Earth in an orbit. At one point in the beginning of the month, we see none of the light that the moon reflects. Around 15 days later, we get to see all of the light that the moon reflects, and that is called a full moon. The process of going from nothing to a full moon is called waxing, and going from full to nothing is called waning. And so Rosh Chodesh is the day of the new moon. It's when the moon is positioned directly in front of the sun, so all the part that is lit up is facing away from Earth. But it's exactly at this moment in the lunar cycle that the moon could potentially line up in front of the sun, causing a solar eclipse. And so it's not a coincidence that the solar eclipse happened today on Monday and tomorrow, or tonight, is the first day of the Jewish month of Nisan. So let's get technical for one second. What is a solar eclipse? Very simply, it's when the moon aligns perfectly and blocks the sun from our view. And this casts a shadow here on Earth called the Umbra, and if you're here in New York City, we were actually not in the direct shadow, but in the kind of shadow area called the Penumbra. Now, just a quick point to clarify, we experienced a solar eclipse, which is when the Earth kind of goes dark, especially if you're directly in that shadow, and not a lunar eclipse, when the moon appears red, sometimes called the blood moon. During a solar eclipse, the moon blocks the sun from Earth, but during a lunar eclipse, it's the Earth that blocks the sun from the moon, and this causes the moon to get shadowy or to turn bright red. Now, by looking at this map, you can see the dotted line going across the United States, and this is known as the path of totality, which means this is where the shadow is directly hitting the Earth. Now, as you can see, New York City is right at the edge of the orange zone, which means that we didn't get a full eclipse, but we got to see most of it, around 90% or so. Now, just as a quick fun fact, the last time America experienced a total solar eclipse was seven years ago in 2017. Here's a photo of the president at the time and his family taking a look at the solar eclipse through special glasses, which we'll talk about in a minute. And the next total solar eclipse that will happen in the United States will be in 2044, in exactly 20 years from now. And just to clarify once again, when we say total eclipse, we're referring to when the moon aligns perfectly in front of the sun, 
basically blocking all of the light, maybe leaving just a little thin ring around it. But here in New York City, we got a partial solar eclipse, which means that the moon only blocked part of the sun, giving it a crescent shape, what you might see typically in the moon. Another cool thing that you can see during a total solar eclipse is the atmosphere of the sun, known as its crown or corona. And just as a quick story, um, if you've ever seen a balloon floating before, it's filled with a gas called helium. And this gas was first discovered during a solar eclipse by this French astronomer by the name of Pierre Jensen, pretty sure that's how you pronounce it. And he was able to discover helium by studying the light of the sun during an eclipse through this device called a spectroscope. Without getting too technical, a spectroscope takes the light of every element and turns it into a unique color spectrum, kind of like a barcode. And by comparing these lines of color, we get to understand which elements are present. And what happened was Jensen and other astronomers were looking at this solar eclipse and noticed this gas they had never seen before. So they named it after the sun, after Helios. And so this element became known as helium. Now throughout history, people would look at the solar eclipse, but in modern times, people understood that it was a bad idea to observe it directly. So what they started to do was to observe it through something called a pinhole, where you take a piece of paper and poke a little hole through it and observe the light of the eclipse that way. The problem is that you were still staring directly into the light of the sun, which can cause damage to the eyes. And so after a while, people came up with other ways to use the penhole viewer, like this screenshot from the show Mad Men, which depicts the 1963 solar eclipse that happened in New York. And you can see that all the children are looking at the solar eclipse through a penhole at the top of the box, which casts a light in the shape of the source inside of the box. And since normally the sun is round, we would just get a round light inside of the box. During an eclipse, when the moon blocks it, we get a crescent shape inside of the box. In fact, during the solar eclipse today, I actually tried this out with a cereal box, and this is the image that I got through my pinhole viewer. But of course, most people tend to look at the solar eclipse through special glasses. These lenses are made out of a special plastic that block basically all light, except very little from the sun itself. So technical part aside, what does Jewish tradition have to say about the solar eclipse? To do that, let's take a look at a passage in the Talmud in Tractate Sukkah, page 29a. In there, the Talmud is discussing a specific law about the holiday of Sukkot, Sukkot. During that holiday, there is a commandment to sit in a special hut, which gives the holiday its name, called a sukkah. Now, normally, you would sit in the sukkah the entire length of the holiday, but if it starts raining heavily, you can go back inside to your home. But the Talmud explains that this is not really a good sign and it really gives us, well, bad vibes. The Talmud gives us a story to help illustrate this. Imagine if you were trying to give someone a cup of water and they took it and splashed it directly into your face. Yeah, that wouldn't feel really good at all. We would say that bad vibes. And so us trying to serve God by sitting in the sukkah and then it rains gives us the same energy, the same bad vibes of someone spraying water in our face. Immediately following this passage, it talks about solar eclipses, and it gives a similar story where a king invited people into his home for a nice cozy meal, and he even presents to them this beautiful lamp. But then halfway through the meal, he just takes it away and he says, you know what, everyone, you can just sit in darkness. Now, we would say that that is bad vibes. And the Talmud is telling us that the same way the sun gives us good energy on Earth, allows us to thrive and to live, but during an eclipse, when it temporarily goes away, it gives us that bad vibes.
Now, although the Talmud goes into a lengthy discussion about solar and lunar eclipses and the reasons in Jewish tradition why they might happen, ultimately the conclusion of that passage is that the eclipse serves as an opportunity for introspection. And just like the day before Rosh Chodesh, the first of the month, is often observed as a time for prayer and reflection, and of course the end of the lunar year, Rosh Hashanah, is famously a time for introspection, the solar eclipse serves the same exact purpose. It's meant to get us to think about our own deeds, how we relate to each other, to God, and to the world around us. So now that we understand eclipses from a Jewish perspective, let's go back to the verse in Genesis that we started with. So we know that Isis, signs, refers to eclipses. Moadim, festivals, is referring to the lunar cycle. Let's look at the last two roles that the solar system plays in Jewish tradition, days and years. These two words refer to the relationship that the Earth has with the Sun, namely rotation and revolution. Rotation means how the Earth spins around on its own axis, a cycle which takes about 24 hours to complete, and this gives us our day and night. The Earth's revolution is how the Earth travels around the Sun in its orbit, taking around 365 days, or a year, to complete, and this gives us our seasons. Now, if you remember, the first commandment that Jews received was to follow the lunar calendar, and this presents a very interesting problem in the Jewish calendar. The solar year, the time it takes for the Earth to go around the Sun, is roughly 365 days, while the lunar year, 12 lunar cycles, is roughly 354 days. And so there's an 11-day difference between these two calendars. What happens is that after about three years, there's going to be over 30-day difference between these cycles, which means that the lunar calendar is going to fall behind the solar calendar a full month. After three times of this happening, the holidays will totally shift seasons. Now the Torah is very clear about this as well. In fact, it tells us, Shamar Eschedesh Ha'aviv, which means be careful that the holiday of Passover takes place in the spring season, and by extension that all the holidays take place during the right seasons. As a result, every few years, we add in an extra month to make sure that the lunar calendar is synchronized with the solar seasons. And in fact, this year, we have that happening as well. We call that a Shana Me'uberet, or a leap year, where we added in an extra month of Adar, which we are completing today. So is the solar eclipse connected to the leap year? The short answer is no, but the solar eclipse and the leap year and any other phenomenon in our solar system gives us an opportunity to connect with the world around us, with God, of course, but also with each other. I'm reminded of a different phenomenon in our solar system that happened 15 years ago in Jewish tradition that's known as Birkas Hachama, the blessing of the sun, which is a special blessing that Jews make every 28 years when they believe the sun goes to the spot it was created in. And when this occurred last was 15 years ago when I was just a lad. And I remember being in our shul, our synagogue, and our rabbi who was a very serious individual who would probably never watch movies, screened a film for all of us to watch inside of the shul about what Birka Sahama was, which essentially was a earth science presentation with some Jewish perspectives in it, very similar to the presentation I just gave now. And to this day, I remember that feeling of like, whoa, this is such a cool event because partially we get to understand the solar system, but also because I got to connect with the people around me in my shul in a way we never would have the opportunity to do so. So to end off this presentation, I want to dedicate it to the memory of Rabbi Yisrael Gornish, who passed away a few years ago, 
and this eclipse marks the third anniversary of his passing. So as you walk away from this presentation, I hope that you're able to explain some of these phenomena to your friends and start a conversation and engage with others in a way that maybe you normally wouldn't have, which would be really on brand with what ice ice, the signs of the solar eclipse are really trying to convey to us.